signs and portents. Um, this is this is pretty tough to follow. Uh, but you, you get the gist of it when it's all said and done. And I'll tell you this, the book, Isaiah 53 in the day of the Lord, dictated to me by God. Every word is His. It's, it's scripture. It's divinely received, verbally. Uh, you can find it at keithmccartymccarty.wordpress.com. And if you're really interested in this, when it's all said and done, reading it will probably help. Because it, 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 there's a lot of information that goes into it. The book of Matthew, the Holy Bible, has many statements of prophecy fulfilled that are deceptive and false. This includes reference to prophecy that is not prophecy by unnamed prophets. He doesn't even tell you where he's getting it. Most of the time. In Matthew 1, oh, but you can't find it. I found all of them. Of course, I was being directed by God, but as he taught me the New Testament, and of course, the Hebrew Bible, also called the Old Testament. In Matthew 1, the angel of the Lord in a dream of Joseph said, And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. For he shall save his people from their sins. Now, all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. Well, they called him Jesus. <laughs> I don't know. Prophecy fulfilled. Which being interpreted is God with us. That's Matthew chapter 1 verses 21 and 23. The sentence, all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which is spoken of the prophet, <clears throat> of the Lord by the prophet, is an example of writing a verse that you do not want the reader to be able to verify. The prophet actually is easy to identify as Isaiah. And his account of Emmanuel has nothing to do with the birth of a child named Emmanuel by a virgin. The Hebrew word used by Isaiah is young woman, who it turns out, and I'm going to read it, is the concubine of Isaiah. That's his child. That's his child. She's not a virgin. Period. Isaiah chapter 7 verse 3. The Lord said to Isaiah, Go out with your son, Shir Jahub, to meet Ahaz. That would be King Ahaz. At the end of the conduit of the upper pool. Shir Jashub is footnoted to mean only a remnant will turn back. That's what that name means. In Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14, Isaiah says to Ahaz, Assuredly my Lord will give you a sign of his own accord. Look, the young woman is with child and about to give birth to a son. Let her name him Emmanuel. Emmanuel is footnoted to mean with us as God. Isaiah writes, chapter 8, verse 3. I was intimate with the prophetess, and she conceived and bore a son. And the Lord said to me, Name him Mahir Shalal Hashbaz. Mahir Shalal Hashbaz is footnoted to mean pillage hastens. Looting speeds. Isaiah does not give an account of the mother of only a remnant will turn back, as she symbolizes the bride of God, the Jewish people, who is absent until the remnant returns in repentance. Isaiah writes, chapter 8, verses 17 and 18, 
So I will wait for the Lord who is hiding his face from the house of Jacob, and I will trust in him. Here stand I, and the children of the Lord has given me as signs and portents in Israel from the Lord of hosts who dwells on Mount Zion. So that's what all these different names in the footnotes are about. Signs and portents. They, mean, they have meaning as signs and portents of things to happen. Each of Isaiah's children, only a remnant will turn back, with us is God, and pillar chasing looting speeds had a meaning as a sign and as a portent. The book of Isaiah, the book of two kings, and the book of two chronicles provide the historical account to understand the names of the children of the Lord that the children of the Lord gave Isaiah as signs and portents. The prophetess is footnoted to be the wife of Isaiah, and the young woman about to give birth, who was with Isaiah, Shir, Jahub, and Ahaz at the end of the conduit of the upper pool, would have been his concubine. That was not, <laughs> that was pretty much common back in those days. See Solomon. Okay, in the days of King Pekah of Israel, King, that would be the North Kingdom, King Tiglath Pileser of Assyria came and captured Ajan, Abelbeth Makar, Janoah, Kadesh, Hazor, Gilead, and Galilee. The entire region of Napatali, this is all in the northern kingdom, and deported all the inhabitants to Assyria. Hoshi, son of Ella, conspired against Pekah, son of Ramalia, attacked him and killed him. That's 2 Kings chapter 15, verses 29 and 30. King Rezin of Aram and King Pekah, son of Ramalia of Israel, advanced on Jerusalem to battle. That would have been the southern kingdom of Judah. They besieged Ahaz, but could not overcome him. At that time, King Rezin of Aram recovered Alath for Aram. He drove out the Judites from Elath, and Edomites came to Elath and settled there, as is still the case. Ahaz sent messengers to King Tiglath Pileser of Assyria to say, I am your servant and your son. Come and deliver me from the hands of the king of Aram and from the hands of the king of Israel, who are attacking me. That's 2 Kings, chapter 16, verses 5 and 7. The king, this all leads up to the signs of importance, what they were about. This is, what's, this is the backdrop to what's going on. The king of Assyria responded to his request. The king of Assyria marched against Damascus, and captured it. He deported its inhabitants to Kerr and put Rezin to death. That's 2 Kings 16 and 9. In the twelfth year of King Ahaz of Judah, Hoshi, son of Ella, became king over Israel in Samaria for nine years. In the ninth year of Hoshi, the king of Assyria captured Samaria. He deported the Israelites to Assyria and settled them in Hala, at the river of Habor, at the river of Gaza, and in the towns of Medea. That's 2 Kings 17 and 6. Ahaz, he was, he was king of Judah, southern kingdom, slept with his fathers and was buried in the city in Jerusalem. His body was not brought to the tombs of the kings of Israel. That's 2 Chronicles 28 and 27, uh, chapter 28, verse 27. In the third year of King Hoshi, son of Ella of Israel, Hezekiah, son of King Ahaz of Judah, became king. 
So, when the Lord said to Isaiah, Go out with your son Shishab to meet Ahaz at the end of the conduit of the upper pool by the road of the fuller field, and say to him, Be firm and be calm. Do not be afraid and do not lose heart on account of those two smoking stubs of firebrands. <laughs> on account of the raging of Rezin and his Aramaeans and the son of Romalia, because the Aramaeans with Ephraim and the son of Romalia have plotted against you, saying, We will march against Judah and they will conquer it. And we will set up as king in it, the son of Tabil. Thus said my Lord God, it shall not succeed. It shall not come to pass. That's Isaiah verse 7, uh, chapter 7, verses 3 through 7. And Isaiah said to Ahaz, Assuredly my Lord will give you a sign of his own accord. Look, the young woman is with child and about to give birth to a son. Let her name him Emmanuel. By the time he learns to reject the bad and choose the good, people will be feeding on curds and honey. For before the lad knows to reject the bad and choose the good, the ground whose two kings you dread shall be abandoned. Okay, God is with us. It's, it's the sign. The portent is the two kings you dread shall be abandoned. And when Isaiah writes, I was intimate with the prophetess, and she conceived and bore a son, and the Lord said to me, Name him Maher Shalah Hasbaz. For before the boy learns to call father and mother, which basically means before he starts speaking, I suppose. The wealth of Damascus and the spoils of Samaria and the delights of Rezin and of the son of Ramalia shall be carried off before the king of Assyria. That's Isaiah chapter 8, verses 3 and 4. The Lord is saying that Emmanuel and Mahir Shalah Hasbaz are signs by their names and portents by their individual maturation. The name with us as God is a sign for a house that a ram and Israel will not succeed in their attack on Judah and Jerusalem. And that when Emmanuel learns right from wrong, a ram and an Israel will be gone from the lands they rule. The name pillage hastens, looting speeds, is a sign for Isaiah to watch for pillaging and looting in Damascus and Samaria, when Mahar Shel Hasbaz begins to talk, for before he calls Isaiah father, a ram in Israel will be carried off by the king of Assyria. Based on the historical account and the Lord's signs importance, Isaiah is speaking to Hahaz at the conduit of the upper pool no earlier than the eleventh year of his reign. For in the twelfth year, which is the first year of King Hoshi of Israel, the king of Assyria responded to the request of Ahaz, marched against Damascus, captured it, and deported its inhabitants to Kur. And in the ninth year of King Hoshi of Israel, the king of Assyria captured Samaria and deported the Israelites to Assyria. And the hastened and speeded pillaging and looting of Aram and Samaria would have taken place during this deportation. This means that Emmanuel would have been about nine years old when he came to know right from wrong, and that Maher Shalah Hasbaz spoke his first words when the king of Assyria deported Israel. From the account of signs importance of the deportation of the northern kingdom and Aram, and that the southern kingdom was protected by God, the writer of Matthew says, 
The birth of Jesus by a virgin was prophesied by the prophet according to the angel of the Lord in a dream of Joseph. He had a dream. There was no such prophecy. There was a young woman with child, and that child was named Emmanuel, as a sign important that Judah would not be defeated, deported along with the northern kingdom. A virgin can't give birth. Never happened. And that's not what this was about. It was based on a dream of Joseph, supposedly. This is according to whoever wrote that gospel. We don't know. All the gospels were given names of the, either the disciple or the uh, and a historian. But no, nobody, nobody really in Christianity and in uh, Judaism believes they were the actual disciples that are written about. But this was all about uh, the northern kingdom being defeated and uh, a, a sign that a baby would be born and, you know, call him Emmanuel, God is with us. And uh, uh, the important <laughs> that I've already mentioned. But we do know this young woman who was assuredly the concubine of Isaiah. He was married to the prophetess. And she's with child. And what's she doing down there with him? This is some virgin birth. This, this is some mother of Mary. What's she doing down there? Why is she following Isaiah, Isaiah around? And uh, talking with King Ahaz, who was the father of Hezekiah, who was a great king. A peaceable king. And of course, Judah was not defeated. And, and that's, you know, Matthew, that it was fulfilled. This prophecy. Well, this is no such prophecy. And he doesn't mention what was going on and what, what the children of Isaiah, uh, why they were named as they were. Signs importance. That's all it is. It's not about a virgin woman who. You know, again, this kid didn't know right from wrong until he was nine years old. That's what, that's what all, you got to put it all together. But, uh, and I could have never done it, by the way. God had to show me. This is how it goes together. But, uh, um, look how many times Matthew says that. That it was fulfilled, the prophecy. And, and note how many times he doesn't tell you who the prophet is. Now he's mentioned I, I say this before, but he didn't in this one. I think it's about 10 to 15. And you can find them, and you'll find every one of them is either not prophecy, has been altered, is deceptive, uh, but it has nothing to do with the context that he puts it in to tell his story about this mythical Jesus. And he is a myth. And I got a whole, uh, uh, there's, there's a chapter on that that God dictated to me. And, uh, you know, God will tell you, no, it's not Jesus. It's just something that the Gentiles made up. But, uh, no, God, God of the Jewish people, that's who he is. And uh, he is using a Gentile. Guess who, guess who else? And I just uh, uploaded a, a, a video on this. Elijah, the Tishbite, an inhabitant of Ramoth Gilead. That's the Arab lands. Arab is the Syria lands. Yeah, you know, back in those days, you know, an Israelite was not going to go live in Ramoth Gilead. It just wouldn't have happened, period. And there's no Tishbites. No clans of Tishbites in any of the gene genealogical accounts of the Israelites and the Jewish people, the Hebrew, there, there's no Tishbites. But if you see Elijah's name, invariably, although not always, it's Elijah the Tishbite. You know, God's calling attention to it. And he lives in Ramoth Gilead, Gentile lands, enemy lands. So, uh, 
this is not the first time he's done this. He also he also used Cyrus of Persia to make a declaration that all the exiles could return to build the second temple. So it's not unheard of. Um, well, that's all I got on that. Like I said, if you really want to try to figure out what everything I just read, it's in that book. And it's scripture. It's, it's brand new. I mean, it's 285 pages. And it's just full of knowledge that Judaism has no clue about. Clueless. And how many times they just start making things up. There's no Messianic here. There's no Messianic here. I got plenty of videos on it out there. But, um, you know, the books are there. The, the, there's two books. The second book is The Life of God's Righteous Servant. It's my life. And it's, it's written, God dictated it. It was written to show how I fit every single verse, especially the ones on wounded, chastised, punished, bruised and crushed, uh, maltreated, and what that's all about. It's all explained. And uh, Judaism doesn't have a clue. Toby Singer doesn't have a clue. Michael Skoback doesn't have a clue. And feel free to tell them, Hamoshiach <laughs> said it. You see, they irritate them a little bit because they irritate me because I can't get anybody to listen to me. Everybody says, no, it's the Jews. It's one man, Israel. Really? Really? Now, well, they can't back that up. And I got, I, got, I got videos on that, too, if you want to see. Especially Toby the singer. I mean, you, you know, he, he went Christian. You know, he uses the victims of the Holocaust as the righteous servant of God. Now, I don't know how they got a long life. I don't know how they made the many righteous by their knowledge. And I do know this. They only account for about one-third of the Jews on the planet. It's, it's not 100%. you got to have everybody. You know, when, when that really started coming up was at, at Mount Sinai. When God was making the covenant with them, they gathered as one man and said, we'll do everything you tell us to do. If you will be our God, we will be your people. You know, that's the original covenant. And uh, he repeats that phrase over and over again in talking about the new covenant and the covenant of friendship. So, you know, to the Gentiles, to the Christians, God never let the Jew. He never let the Jew. So, you know, if a Gentile, if a Christian wants to see the heaven God is creating with the name Israel, shall endure, you're going to have to convert to Judaism. That's the only way you'll see heaven. Thank you. <laughs>